far it's been really great. Um, if we talk shop yesterday, please delete all the evidence. I don't want to go online. I've got a brand to maintain it. But other than that, um, yeah, big shout out to all the conference organizers and whatnot. And um, it's been a great you know, conference so far. So in today's talk, what I'm going to be talking about is Swift Concurrency and why I love Swift Concurrency. So just to give yourself a bit of information about me and who I am. So <laughs> don't forget to this video in a second. But I actually currently work at Alice Interactive and what we're working on now is basically the sports product. So we're kind of trying to launch a sports betting platform across different states in America. So I'm actually the lead app developer, kind of leading that within my team. Another thing about me is I'm actually a content creator. So I actually make videos on Swift and Swift UI. I do have some UI kit videos, but personally I just prefer UI, but no one like the first Swift UI developer. And you can actually check out my YouTube channel called Tunsdev. Another thing about me as well is that I actually love anime. I just recently finished watching Vinland Saga. I don't know if you've got any fans in the building, but if you know any good anime or so you want to chat about stuff, give me a shout. And finally, yeah, this video. So basically, this was in Budapest, um, where I went to an amazing city. Um, I just like doing random things, exploring new places, trying out new food. And as you can see, there's me dropping in there like a sweet potato. But um, moving on. What am I going to be talking about today? So I'm going to be talking about, you know, script concurrency and giving you a whole bunch of like code samples and whatnot and different use cases to basically help you out. So everyone's going to get a code sample by the end of this talk. So what is Swift Concurrency? Well, Swift Concurrency was just recently released by Apple and it's actually a way for us to easily um, you know, do concurrent code with the new like, programming language updates. So some of the goals of Swift Concurrency is to make it easy for us to actually understand our synchronous or asynchronous code so we can actually write less closures and actually have more inline code and it's easier to read. We can also find it a lot simpler to actually write this code as well. It's actually a lot easier to write this code as well and maintain it. And also as well, we can introduce you know, less race conditions because we actually have a lot of tools available to us now to actually help us make this a lot easier. And we can utilize a lot of threads as well. So we can actually free up a lot of threads to make sure that we can actually get the most out of our iOS applications. So <clears throat> I actually got a video on my channel I actually got a video on my channel where I actually talk about threading and if you're actually interested in looking at this video, you can actually check it out. Now I'm not going to talk too much about threading in this talk because obviously I only have a little bit amount of time. So before we actually just dive straight into some sort of concurrency, you know, like, you know, examples, I just want to briefly talk about what is asynchronous code. So when you're working with asynchronous code, there's actually an alternative version of it called synchronous code. So what's the difference between synchronous and asynchronous? Well, synchronous is basically a single thread. So you have to literally execute one thing and wait for it to finish before you can carry on. Compared to asynchronous, where you can actually execute multiple things at the same time. So you're actually not waiting for one thing to finish. You can actually run two things at the same time and they'll come back to you when it's ready. So why is this important? Well, the reason why is because we actually work with a lot of applications where you have to basically, you know, fetch data and wait for stuff to happen. Now, when you're writing that code, you probably don't want it to be synchronous. And the reason why is because, think about it this way, if you have an API that takes like maybe two seconds to come back to you, that's a long time for a user to wait. It makes a whole lot more sense to make that code asynchronous. Now, just to show you a real life world example, Let's say you're in a queue, you know, waiting for some food. We've all been in this situation on a night out, you know, you're in a kebab shop or a chicken shop, you're waiting for your chicken burger, and you have to stand in a long queue. Like, this is pretty annoying, but we can actually make this better by just using asynchronous code. So an example of this would be, let's say Uber Eats. When you actually order a chicken sandwich or whatever that may be, you can basically live your best life, like this kid, and, you know, party until your food comes to your doorstep. You don't have to wait for someone, you know, to actually move on to the next person, then go to the desk and then get your food. So when you're writing your code, especially long running tasks, you want to make sure that it's always asynchronous. So we spoke a lot about asynchronous and you've heard me say the keyword tasks. So what actually are tasks? Well, tasks essentially allow us to execute asynchronous code within some kind of context. So with tasks, you're actually able to control the priority of them. So you can actually say whether you want a task to be either a low-level task or a background task or user instantiated. 
You can also control the relationships between tasks as well. So I could actually have a group of tasks within some kind of pairing, or I could just have a bunch of independent tasks if I wanted to. Another thing as well is you can actually handle task cancellation. So I can actually you know, execute some kind of lowering task. And if I don't need that task to be there anymore because someone's left a certain screen, I can actually just cancel it. Now, in this talk, I'm not going to talk too much about task cancellation, but I do actually have you know, some kind of you know, videos on my channel that do cover this topic, which I'll get to towards the end. So let's look at an example of us using tasks. So you can see here in the first example, I've got it in Swift UI. So we actually have a task here where we're essentially trying to fetch data. So what this is going to do is when the view appears, we're actually saying I want you to execute this asynchronous function you know, immediately. So this is how easy it is for us actually to use tasks within Swift UI. Now, you can execute a task within the on a pin, but I personally wouldn't recommend doing that. And the reason why is because if you do that, it doesn't actually automatically handle cancellation for us. So if you're working with Swift UI, you want to use a task modifier. So another thing to note about tasks as well is you can actually in Swift UI and also in the next example is actually listen to changes. Now I don't have an example, so I don't have an example of this, but what you can do is essentially listen to changes with your task as you kind of you know use your applications. Now the second example basically shows me executing a task within a you know non-asynchronous like context. So in order to do this, all we need to do is just literally use the task closure and just say, hey, away, execute some asynchronous function. So it's quite easy for us to use tasks within a you know Swift UI example or within some kind of context that isn't strictly Swift UI. So our first use case. So this might not be like new to you at all, but essentially all this is is just a function that essentially makes some kind of network request. Now I'm not going to go through all of this and the reason why is because <coughs> it's difficult to read, first of all. The next thing is, it's actually a lot to write as well, and it's easy to forget. So just looking at this code, I don't know if anyone to realize where the actual problem may be. Well, if you click line 39, you'll see that I've actually forgot to actually put a use case in there. So let's say, for example, if I actually decode what I get back from the service, and it basically fails the user will be stuck in this scenario. So there's actually no way for us to throw back an error to the user. So it's very easy for us to forget to handle all of the you know, paths within our you know, closure-based example here. And there's actually one more annoying thing that we have to do as well within this example. We have to call resume. So it's very easy for us to forget to actually call resume as well. So how can we make this better? Well, what we can do is actually call the same code in async await. So this is the exact same example, but this time we're calling the exact same code in async await. So me personally, I'm not going to lie to you all, I feel like this looks a lot nicer and it's a lot easier to read as well. So it's easier to read. We've actually cut the number of lines of code that we wrote before in half as well. And we've also handled all of our case paths. So you'll see that I'm actually throwing errors within the guard statement. So when a URL is invalid, or alternatively, if we're not within a valid status code. And also as well, if something goes wrong with the system level API provided to us for executing an asynchronous you know, task, or as well trying to decode some data, we can just use the try keyword, and those errors will be propagated up via the function. And there's no need for us to call resume anymore because the URL session task will actually automatically be executed for us. Now, you're looking at this and you may be wondering if you've never saw this before. You know, there's a few keywords that I'm not sure about. Let's just discuss them. So there's actually a few keywords here that you may or may not know. So the first keyword is async. The next one is throws. You may know that one. There's also try, which you may also be aware of. And there's also a wait as well. So let's actually just break down what each one of these actually means. So when you're working with async and you actually want to use an asynchronous function, you need to mark your function as async. So marking as async is essentially you saying that I want my function to be asynchronous. 
There's also a weight as well. So with the await keyword, you're essentially marking a suspension point. So this is no different to you basically saying that I want you to wait for this task to finish, and then when it resumes, it should continue. We've also got try and throws. Now what you could do is you could use a result type, but me personally, I just prefer just to throw errors. So in here, we're just saying that I want to try, you know, this function. Any, you know, errors will be propagated up because of the throws keyword. And another thing you might have realized is that there's actually no closures within this function as well. So instead, we simply just return the type. So in this case, we're just saying that I want to return some type of codable. Now that's not to say that all your asynchronous functions need to return something. They actually can just be void if you want them to as well. But in this example, we're just returning some stuff. Cool. So how would we actually use it? Well, what we can do is we just got like a music view model here, and I just got like an array of songs that will store all the songs that I fetch from my service. Now the function I saw before was actually within the network manager, and you can see here this is how I'm actually calling it. So one thing you'll notice is that on the line when we're fetching our songs, I've actually got the try and the away keyword. So when you're executing an asynchronous function, you need to make sure that you use the await keyword to basically say, I want to wait for this, you know, to execute. Now the try keyword is there because I said that that function could throw some kind of errors and we're setting it within the songs. So this isn't really, you know, too crazy. But I don't know if you realize, but it's actually a problem with this code right here. So if you used to run this within the SwiftUI preview, you wouldn't actually get this warning but if you was to run this on the simulator, you actually would get a warning. So the warning would be is that you're actually updating your UI on a background thread. Now when we execute our network requests, they're actually done on a background thread, they're not done on a main thread. So what we need to do is we actually need to put this back onto the main thread. Now you may be used to just using dispatchq.main async to solve all your problems in life, but in this example, we're not going to use that. Instead, what we can do is just use the main actor annotation on top of our function. So what this will essentially do is it will literally let us place our updates back onto the main thread for our UI. Now it's worth noting that this main actor annotation, you could actually put this on the top of the class and all the functions within that class would actually gain you know, updates back onto the main thread. But in my personal preference, I just prefer to just literally mark my function specifically with the ones that I want to be on the main thread. So, another use case, multiple resources. Now, just to let you guys know, yeah, I don't work with Spotify, I just like the way the app looks. <laughs> so, if you've got any Beyonce fans as well, come and talk to me later because the new album is amazing. But basically, how do we handle a situation like this? So we've got recommendations, and we've also got podcasts below. We need to fetch two resources from two different places. Now, in old examples, you probably have nested closures to be one after the other, but how can we achieve this in async away or just using Swift concurrency? Well, what we could do is we could write this. Now, this is technically valid, but I'll get on to why you know, we could actually make this better. So what we're essentially saying here is that I want to actually fetch me the recommended content and then after that I want to fetch me the podcast. So based on what I just said, we're actually waiting for recommending recommendations to come back and then we'll wait for podcasts to come back. So we'll basically have to wait for two things to kind of like finish one after the other one. So that's not really performing in my opinion. How can we make that better? Because in the future, we may want to add another thing in here to call afterwards. Maybe you want to get someone's, you know, favorited songs or whatever. So we can actually make this a whole lot better. And we can do that by using async let. So what async let allows us to do is actually run a number of defined, basically, asynchronous functions in parallel. So we can essentially say that I want you to run these two asynchronous functions at the same time and just tell me when they both finish. So let's look at our example before, but this time using async let. So we've got this function now where it's going to basically fetch content, but one thing that's new is that rather than using the try away, we're actually now using the async let keyword. So you can see on line seven and line eight, we're now basically saying that these two asynchronous functions I want you to run these two in parallel. 
So what's going to happen is that these two will run in parallel. And it's worth knowing that when you execute these tasks in parallel, you don't know when they're going to finish because you're just basically saying execute both of them and just tell me when they both finish. Now, because we don't know when they're both will have finished, we actually have to wait for both of them to finish when we try to access the value. So you'll see on line 11 and 12, we're using the try await keyword to actually await the recommendations and the podcast within our functions. So once both of these finish, what we're then going to do is we're essentially going to return an array of our content that we've mapped from our service. So now we actually have a more performing you know, function where we're essentially doing things in parallel, using the most out of our threads, and then returning that. And in the future, if we wanted to, we could add another you know, task in parallel to our function. So our next use case. So fetching images. So sticking with um, Spotify, who I don't work for. How can we get an undefined list of images? So in this example here, you might be in a situation where you actually have a bunch of images that you need to show on your UI. Now, we can't really use async let with this, and the reason why is because each user has their own personalized experience, so what I might have might be different to you. I mean, there's probably some people here that don't even know who Beyonce is, but basically, what we can do is we can essentially just say that, hey, you might have eight images, and I might have six images, you might have five images, so what we can actually do here is actually use something called a task group. And the reason why we want to use a task group and not something like async collect is because we've got an undefined collection of images that we need to fetch. So what are task groups? Well, task groups allow us to execute an undefined collection of asynchronous tasks concurrently. So we actually have to wait for all the child tasks within a task group to finish before we can return its value. So things to know about task groups as well is that it's a collection. So it actually holds a collection of child tasks within it. Another thing is that they're actually independent. So they actually run in parallel at the same time. And because of that, there isn't an order. So you don't actually know when a child task may finish. The first one that you set up might actually not finish first, it might finish last. It depends. Also as well, you have to wait for all of them to finish before you can actually return you know, your task group. And also as well, it can return all throw. Now it's worth noting with task groups as well that you don't have to actually return all throw any kind of error. But the example that we're going to go through, I'm going to be doing both. So let's look at an example of task groups. So I've got a function here, which essentially just going to basically fetch me a bunch of basically pictures that I can display on the UI. So let's just break down each step of this function because this is might be new syntax to some of you. So the first thing we need to do on our function is actually mark it as async throws, and we need to set the type that we want to return, which is an array of pictures, because we want to get back a collection of pictures. Next thing we want to do is we're actually going to use async await to basically get us back an array of URL that we want to actually fetch our images for. So this is going to give us back the URLs that we're going to request from the service. Then we just define the type of task group that we want. So I'm actually using a throwing task group here, but you don't have to use a throwing task group. You can just use a standard task group if you wanted to. Now, two things to note here is because it's throwing, I'm using the try keyword because it could throw some kind of error. And I'm also using a wait because we need to wait for our child task to finish within our task group. And then we define the type. So I'm saying that each one of my child tasks should return a picture. Now it's worth knowing here that this could also be void, so you actually don't need to return anything. You don't want to, you know, perform any kind of like updates in the UI. You could just do something in the background. For this example, I'm just going to be returning a picture, and then this is where we set up our child task. So from our array of URLs that we had before, we're now going to loop through each one of these URLs. And then within that, we're basically going to create a child task, as you can see on line 8, where we basically say group.addTask. And then within that child task, we're going to execute some asynchronous code to fetch a picture. Once that's finished, we'll return the picture. And then finally, we access the children. So each one of the child tasks, we actually extract the value and we just loop through. And then when we finish looping through, we'll just return the photos. 
So within the loop, you'll see that I'm actually appending to an array of pictures. So this is the pictures that will display on our UI. So carrying on with our pictures example, how can we handle things like caching images? So when you're using your app, like this example again, we don't want to be in a situation where if you switch tab, we're basically making another request to get all those pictures all over again because from a user experience standpoint, you have to wait again, it's not the best. So we actually need someone to actually store and cache these images. So where can we do that? Well, what we could do is we could create something like this where we kind of just have like a singleton storage for an NS cache where we actually store our pictures. So I've just got a cache here and it's got a string, there's a key and images that we just store. We've got our count limit and we've got a size limit here as well and functions to set and get an image. Now, there's a few problems with this with our task group. Now, the first problem is, is, like I said before, with our task group, each one of the child tasks actually run in parallel, independently. So we actually don't know when a child task will finish. Also as well, how can we make this thread safe without having to use like NS logs and all that kind of stuff, which in my opinion is pretty open to write. And if we were to ship this, there's a big chance we could actually get data races, which we definitely don't want in our application. So how can we improve this? Well, what we could do is use something called actors. So actors allow us to actually protect your state from data races. So how can we improve our code from before, but this time make it an actor? Well, all we need to do is rather than just declare it as a class, it's just using the actor keyword, and now we've got our thread away safe way of us updating our storage. So that's all we need to do, is just use it and mark it as an actor, nice and easy, and we'll just use it like we would any other type of reference type. So how would we actually use the actor in, you know, an actual example? So in our fetch photos function, how could we use that? Well, we could just use dependency injection and essentially inject it via our function. So now we have our actor available to us within our function to fetch photos. And then all we need to do is to simply call set. But one thing you'll realize with our cache is that I've actually got the await keyword there because we actually need to wait for our actor to be updated before we can do any other updates. So this actually helps us safely update our actor without introducing data races. So, there is a lot more, but I'll be honest with you, I don't have time to go through everything that's good from current set. <laughs> so, basically, um, I'm going to recommend to you a video that I have on my channel. So I actually do have a free script on Proxy course on my channel that actually has code samples of some of the topics I've covered today. And you can actually download the code samples from my GitHub as well. So if you're interested, you can just grab it from here. Another thing to know as well on my channel is I actually have a few more other courses as well. So I have courses on, you know, if you want to get started with Swift UI, how to build a contest, which I'm currently, you know, working on now. Also, how to handle data flow with your Swift UI applications, and as well, MVVM examples as well. So it's worth knowing that all of this is just playlists on my channel that are all free. And if you are interested in subscribing to my channel, here's a link and a QR code. You can check out my channel. You can see that was a long slide on the top. See how slow I was to press the button to go to the next slide. And if you want to follow me on Twitter as well, here is my Twitter, Tons Dev. So I actually had this yesterday. It was like a pork and onion sandwich. Best thing I've ever had in my entire life. And one treat I have for everyone here. I think there's more than 50 people here, so this is going to be pretty exclusive. But I actually do have some laptop stickers. So if anyone is interested in a free laptop sticker, come and give me a shout after the talk and I'll take out my pocket. I'll try and make it not look dodgy. And that's everything from me. I appreciate you all, you know, taking the time out to listen to my talk. I hope you learned some interesting and new things about Swift concurrency. That's all. Deuces. If anyone has any questions, fire away.
Thanks for your talk. Um, I have a question. Um, do you have any recommendation when to use combine instead of adding away? Because with adding sequence, you can now cover almost all the features of combine. So I was actually going to put a section in this about combine, but I wasted my slides on Oprah. But basically, um, I'm be honest with you, um, it depends on your personal project. If you're someone who is working on a company that likes reactive programming, I'm not going to say to you, hey guys, refactor everything to use with concurrency because, let's be honest, product owners are probably going to be like, it's fine, it works as it is now. But if you're someone who started a brand new project and you've got a clean slate, in my opinion, when you have this like async sequence, we've now got async algorithms as well, um, I would probably start with Swift concurrency. So you were, you were talking about task groups and how it has to wait for every task inside to finish. And so if you're batch loading, let's say, 20 photos, and one of these network calls hangs, so 19 of your photos are kind of stuck, waiting to be displayed because of one network call that's taking a long time. Is there a way to mitigate this? Because I know as a user, you'd want every photo to show up when it's done, regardless of whatever else is loading. Yeah, so you've actually exposed me because there's actually a bit of my slide I was going to talk about. <laughs> so basically, to handle that bit, I actually recommend using a detached task. So with a detached task, it would actually allow you to independ like independently execute tasks concurrently. So you can actually handle each task independently. You don't have to wait for everything to finish and then throw in return. Because obviously in your example, if, you, you know, if you're an app like Instagram with the grid, if you have like 25, 50 bowls, you don't want to have to wait for 50 bowls. As a user, that's really slow. So you probably want to use like a detached task. I don't have the microphone. I think that. Don't worry, I also have that for you today. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to express my different opinion about using detached tasks because, exactly for that case, I would maybe recommend handling the, the structured concurrency control and also can provide partial, partial result. Mm -hmm. And that maybe would be the recommended approach I would take in that case. If you can come in. Um, my question is about the memory implications of using async await and throws uh, in combination with each other. Because in our uh, in previous practice with closures, we always knew the kind of reference cycles that would uh, occur, and we knew how to mitigate them. But do we just trust async await to do the memory management to, to know what it's doing, or is there something that um, as developers, we need to be mindful of. I think it's something you still need to be mindful of because recently in my work, we actually had a few weeks when we were creating tasks from like a non synchronous context, asynchronous context, and we're having a few weeks. So within the task, we did have to like kind of handle like weak self and whatnot. So I wouldn't just assume that hey, if I create a closure for a task, everything's going to be all good. You probably want to make sure that you know you're not capturing any closures and whatnot. Here. Are you excited for One Punch Man Season 3? I'm ready, bro. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best question. <laughs>